Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. Precise you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So we're looking at rethinking life, subtitled, the place of sacrifice. We talked about sacrifice as the basic requirement for overflow. We talked about sacrifice as the basic requirement for abundance. We talked about sacrifice as the basic requirement for a better life, for joy, for peace. Sacrifice is key. There is nothing good that does not require sacrificial living. You cannot live, ex you cannot live a life that is fulfilling except you live a sacrificial life. In fact... I ran this by my wife when the Holy Spirit dropped this in my mind, in my spirit. It says, every sacrifice is a response to a promise or a better future. Every sacrifice, be it sacrificial, you living, giving, or you living as a student, burning the midnight candle, guess what? You burning the midnight candle is a response for a better life. So, sacrifice is a response for a better life, or sacrifice is a response to a promise. The reason why most people don't sacrifice is because there is nothing they are responding to. They are not seeing a brighter future. The moment you see a clear future, the moment you see a bright future, the moment you are able to see the possibility of what could be, it triggers you to give Everything for that. Am I communicating? So the Holy Spirit dropped this in my spirit, and I just shared that with Pastor Gloria on my on our way back on Thursday. That does this make sense to you? Because I'm, I'm trying to wrap myself in that sacrifice is a response to a promise or a better tomorrow. The reason why we are sacrificing to come here this morning to hear the word of God is because you are looking at bettering yourself so that you can spend eternity with God the Father in heaven. So everything that is good requires sacrifice. If you want a good marriage, if you want a good life, you have, you have to sacrifice. If you are not willing to sacrifice, it's as a result that you have not seen what could be. Scripture records that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. What made Jesus endure the cross was what he saw was a bright future, a glorious future where God begins to harvest every one of us into the kingdom. The Bible says we were in his heart when he was on the cross. He saw us saved. He saw us delivered. He saw us spending eternity with the Father in heaven forever and forever. So he was willing and he was able to go through that pain. So, if you are not seeing a better future for your life, for those of us that are students, you know why people fail? They go to school, they don't do well, they don't see a bright future. So, they live for themselves. They just live anyhow. But the moment God is able to cast a vision for you, you know what tomorrow could be. You do everything in your power. And, that's, and everything you do, we call it sacrifice just for a greater future. Amen. So today we're going to be looking at Abraham. If I don't finish, I'll pick it off from the next service. But I'm going to get this done today because we're starting a new series now, next week by the grace of God. If Jesus tarries. Yeah. Abraham was going to face the greatest test. We're going to be looking at Abraham, the place of sacrifice. Abraham at this time in Genesis chapter 22, I've been actually making reference to it, but I'm just going to sit on, January, on Genesis 22 from verse 1 to verse number 13. Now, we, in Genesis 30, 22, we've seen Abraham is going to be tested, and the greatest test of his life He's going to be facing the greatest test of his life because God is now going to usher him to the greatest height any human being can ever attain. God was going to be placing Abraham in a great height. God was going to be confirming his promise. So God was going to give him the greatest test of his life. And so in Genesis chapter 22, amen. In Genesis chapter 22 from verse number 1, where we're told that God called Abraham 
from nowhere, and God says, Abraham, let me get there, Genesis 22, verse number 1. It says, and, and it came to pass, and after these things, that God did tempt Abraham, and said unto Abraham, and he says, here am I. God called him, and he says, here am I. He says, and he says unto him, take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a bond offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee. God says to Abraham, the Bible says God tempted him or God tested him. Some version will say God tested him. And the test is this. Fake that son of yours, the only son, and let me be sure that you understand what I'm saying. I'm talking about Isaac, God is saying to Abraham. Your only son, the one you love the most, the one you cannot do without, I want you to check that son and offer him as a burnt offering. And you are not going to tell me where place you are going to offer him. I will show you the place. Sometimes when we read this very, very verse, we just look at it and we glance through. It was two difficult tasks that God was giving to Abraham. The first task God was giving to him, God says, you know what? You're going to take the thing you love the most. And guess what? You're not going to decide where you're going to offer him. I will decide. So you are going to be walking on for three days. You're going to be taking a journey for three days not knowing where you're going to. It takes obedience. It takes focus. Am I communicating? And it takes great love. Because well, why did God do that? How come God did not just say, you know what, just take, take your son Isaac to your backyard and kill him for me and raise an altar? God says, no. I'm going to give him every opportunity to back out of this. I'm going to give him every opportunity. The place of sacrifice are places that we don't just casually get into. And every time and every month and every year, God will always instruct us on that place. It's not every place, but there is a place. The reason why most of us have not entered into the blessings or the full blessings of God's promise to us is because, yes, we do offer sacrifice, but we have not been able to pinpoint the place of sacrifice. For Isaac, the place of his sacrifice was, two, was in two levels. One, he had to give the thing he loved the most. Two, the place must be decided not by him, but by God whom he loved and he served. So Abraham was called to the place of sacrifice. Verse 1, it says that it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and says, Abraham, and he says, yeah, here I am. The word tempt simply means God says God was testing him. God is the one that orchestrated this whole journey. You must know this. When we talk about sacrifice, they are always initiated by God. They are not what we initiated. And sacrifice are always response to a promise or a better future. Now, without understanding or without having a preview of what the better future is or the, what the promise is, there's no way you will be willing to give sacrifice. The reason why people cannot sacrifice for God is because they've not been able to come to that place or get to that understanding of what God actually has for them. Told us last week that sacrifice has everything connected to our faith. The greater your sacrifice is, Is the greater your faith. You can measure a sacrifice to the faith of the person. And faith always responds to a promise. Because faith is a call to a promise. Our call is a call to a promise. 
So the event was not scheduled by Abraham, but the event was scheduled by God. God was the one that planned it. God was the one that actually told Abraham exactly what he needs or what he wants for the sacrifice. So there is that place for sacrifice. There are two things I want to draw out here. God had a purpose in mind. For every sacrifice, it has to be the mindset of God. For every sacrifice that God will require from you, it has to be God's purpose. And that's why Paul, where we read Romans chapter 12, verse number 1, Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice. It now says the sacrifice is not only going to be living, the sacrifice must be holy and the sacrifice must be acceptable. If the sacrifice is based on your term, then Paul doesn't have to say the sacrifice must be acceptable. Amen. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because we live in a grace, we live in a wonderful time that people think their Christian life, the way they live their Christian life must be administered by what they think should be. Our Christian walk is not what we decide. The acceptability of our walk with God, the acceptability of what we should do as Christians, how we should conduct our life, is not what is going to be approved by us, but it's approved by him and him only. So as I talk about sacrifice, I'm not talking only about money or other things. I'm talking about your life as a living sacrifice. God is not asking us to sacrifice bulls. It's not asking us to sacrifice goats. But it's saying in this new covenant that the sacrifice that God is looking for is you becoming holy. It's you becoming a living being, living after the pattern of our Lord Jesus Christ. That it's no longer you that live, but you have yielded everything at the altar of God. And you say, it's no longer me. Told us last week that Abraham, God accepted his sacrifice even though he did not kill his son. Because Isaac died when he yielded his will to God. In the eyes of God, Isaac was dead. Give it up. When we yield our life to Christ, that is what he's talking about. So when I'm talking about sacrifice, I'm not talking about a Christianity that you determine what you can do and what you cannot do. I'm talking about Christian work that is only determined by what the God Almighty that has called us into this living, into this faith, into this walk, into this journey. He is the one that will prescribe what is living, what is holy, and what is acceptable. We live in a world today that we are hearing different voices. You hear people say, well, I, have, I can live my life the way I want. I've given my heart to him. But if you've given your heart to him, your life should be in accordance with his ways and his word. Pastor George, why are you saying all these things? Why are we talking about living sacrifice? I'll tell you again, we live in a We live in a dangerous time. Just last Tuesday, I was sharing with my wife. I said, I don't know why we are doing what we're doing with all this in our house. Because if the rapture was to take place tomorrow, this house belongs to someone else. So what I'm saying, in essence, with, to my wife is that this is the time we begin to invest in our eternal life. This is the time we begin to invest in our soul. This is the time we begin to prepare our spirit to meet with the Lord. This is the time we begin to align ourselves, becoming a living sacrifice. We're becoming not only a living sacrifice, but becoming a holy sacrifice. He says, be ye holy as your heavenly Father is holy. Jesus himself said that. He said we should be holy even as God that has called us is holy. But what is the word telling us? No, you can live anyhow. You can just come to church on Sunday. That is not acceptable to the Almighty God because He is the one that determines the place of the sacrifice. He is the one that determines also the sacrifice. It was all His plan. He has a purpose in mind. 
What was the plan of God? Look at verse number 2 of Genesis chapter, chapter 1. Genesis, Genesis chapter 22, verse number 1 and 2. And God tested him. So God had a plan in mind. God has a purpose. Why he's testing him? God has a purpose in mind why he's asking for the greatest sacrifice that Abraham can ever offer to this almighty God. The second thing we find out from verse 1 and verse 2 is that not only that God has a purpose in mind, the purpose was to tempt him, was to test him. The second thing we saw here is that God had a plan in mind. Not only that God has a purpose in mind, God has a plan in mind. What was the plan? To a mountain. Take your son, your only son, the one you love. Sacrifice him in a mountain that I will show you. It has to be his way. This is the time I'm calling the church to holiness. This is the time I'm calling the church to righteous living. This is the time I'm calling you all to begin to follow Jesus Christ. Because that is what is required in this time that we live in. We live in a very dangerous time. The rapture can take place even right now. In fact, no one is guaranteed tomorrow. The trump can sound at any time. Every prophecy that needs to take place has already taken place. The only thing we are waiting for, the only thing we are looking, we are looking up for the trump of God to, sh to blast. And those of us we, we, who are alive will be changed in a, in a moment. We will be caught up to be with the Lord forever and forever. It's not going to be a thing that there is going to be announcing or giving us warning to get yourself prepared. And that's why he's saying this is the time for us to become living sacrifice. Take away everything that is not godly. This is the time for us to begin to have our heart circumcised by the word of God. This is the time that we begin to live life that is pleasing to our master because we live in a dangerous time. But the enemy is throwing everything. And everything he throws at us is just to discourage us from following our Lord. Everything. For it is it, making Christianity easy so that we can miss our Savior. It's contaminating the walk or the way of God by telling us that we can believe anything. And everything. By telling us that we have to choose where we are going to make this sacrifice or how we are going to live for God. By telling us that we have the right to dictate how we live our life and not the word of God. That is the world we live in today. And guess what? The most dangerous thing is that most believers are bought into this. And that's why we are talking about this. So God not only has a purpose in mind, he has a plan in mind. Abraham was willing to go to the place of sacrifice with his son. What is that son in your life? What is that thing in your life that you so cherish? And it's standing between you and your walk with God. What is that thing in your life that is distracting you from wholly following this God? God told Isaac, God told Abraham, that is what I want you to sacrifice to me. Amen. Amen. So Abraham was very ready. To offer his son, Isaac. Abraham was not ready to allow anything to stop him from offering his son. Why? Because Abraham already has surrendered his life to the Lord. 
For Abraham is no longer Abraham. Think about it. If God had asked you to sacrifice the only, your only child, will you do it? Now we can read this story. We can read it and we can say, whoa, wow, wow, Abraham was nice. But will you do it? Because Abraham is just like us. Even we are far better than Abraham because we live in a better covenant. What is that thing that God is asking you to let go so that he can fill up your heart? What is that thing that takes you away from serving God wholly? We cannot enter into God's promises except we are willing to lay that thing that is most precious to us at the altar of God. And that was what Abraham found out. Submission is necessary for us to be fully be, for us to fully be in the will of God. We can't stay in the, we cannot have God being in the center of everything we do except for us we submit. And that was what God was looking for in the life of Abraham. That's what God is looking for in our lives. And, and I say this to say that it's very crucial and it's key. It, Let's not be deceived. Because so many Christians have been deceived. And sometimes we go high, we go low, we just get ourselves entangled with the things of this world. Let's not be deceived. It takes total submission to God for us to be in God's will. If we're not totally surrendered to God, there's no way we can be in God's will. We cannot be in God's will when we are half submitted. The only time we can be in God's will and God's perfect will is when we are totally submitted to him. Submission is key. So how does Abraham, in these verses we just read in, how does Abraham submit to God? The first thing Abraham did in submitting to God is that Abraham's submission is indicated by his works. We're going to see that. The things he did. The way he lived his life. Your surrender is going to be indicated by your works. Not what you really think or by your works. So in verse number three, let's look at verse number three. So Abraham's surrender is indicated by his walk. So look at what Abraham did. And Abraham arose in the morning. His walk. God told him the previous night that Abraham, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to take your son, Isaac, whom you love the most, and take him for a three days journey to a mountain place that I'm going to show you off. I'm sure Abraham must have asked God, God, what, what is the address? I know, I, I know that neighborhood, but which of those mountains? God says, no, you don't need to know. Just follow me. Because God wants to be sure that Abraham was fully surrendered. Your full surrender is actually indicated by you following him. Whether good or bad. Whether people are coming along, but you are still following him. You have this statement in the depth, in the back of your heart, that others may, but I cannot because I am a follower of God. It doesn't matter who is following God. It doesn't matter who is not following God. But I have made up my mind, like Joshua would say, as for me and my household, we are serving this God forever. The whole world may go east. We are just going to follow him. We're not going to be swayed by the things going on. We're not going to be moved by what is going on around us. Our commitment must be with God and must be with him and him only. That was what Abraham do, does. His surrendering was indicated by his work. And so verse 3 says, And Abraham arose early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and clave the wood for a burnt offering and arose and went into the place of which God had stolen him. He did not debate. In fact, he, didn't never, even, he never even consulted with his wife. 
because he's dealing with God. The only thing you can consult with at this time that we live in is this world. Because every other thing can fail you. Your pastor can fail you. Your pope, your bishop can fail you. The only thing you can consult is this world. If it's not here, don't follow. If you can't find it here, this triggered. And if it's here, cleave to it, hold it tight, walk with it. Abraham rose early in the morning. Why? Because he had the voice of God. He had God instructing him what to do. The Bible says he rose in the morning, took his two sons, verse number four. Then the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place of Harold. Three days journey. He was totally surrendered. Are you surrendered? Are you living a surrendered life? Is Christ the Lord over your life? Is Christ your master? Are you truly following? Is he your Lord? Are you waiting for his return? Are you living as those wise five, five virgins? In Matthew chapter 26, that had extra oil. Why would they go for extra oil? There were ten virgins. Five of them, the Bible calls them foolish because they just, uh, they were setting the pace for their own life. There was no need. But the five wise ones, the Bible says they took extra oil because they were not sure, but they were just going to follow the master. Their focus was on the master. Their focus was in the Lord. So they were taking everything, extra precaution. They went extra mile. They were uncomfortable with the norms. They were saying, no, we are going to live a life of sacrificial, a sacrificial life, a living, we are going to be a living sacrifice, we're going to be alive, we're going to be a, alive, waiting for the bridegroom to appear. Scripture records, you know the story. Abraham was ready. Why he lived a surrendered life. You know, when you live a surrendered life, you know you're not in charge. The first, one of the first jobs I did when I came to this great country is to be a waiter. In fact, I was opportune to work in one of the finest restaurants, uh, Rose, Wolf, Rose, Rose Wolf Restaurant, Boston Harbor Hotel. And I'm sure God taught me great lesson in, in serving there for some years what it means to wait. A surrendered life is what it means to wait on the Lord. So every time we come to the office and um, the, the dining room opens here about 6.30, but by 3.30 we're there. 3.30. The dining is open at 6 or 6.30. By 3 we're there Polishing everything, making sure, looking at all the, the stencils and we're polishing and we're getting ourselves ready, getting your station ready, getting all the coffee, getting all the tin brewed, getting everything ready. Why? We're waiting for guests. We're not in control. And when we, and when the guest comes in, we welcome them to their table and we are constantly, our eyes is just this looking straight at the guest table, waiting for any, any move of hers were there. What do you want, sir? That's waiting. When you wait, it's, you're no longer waiting on your time. It's not your time. We don't have time. He has all the time. Because he told us when he was going, he says, the hour 
of my return. No one knows, not even the angel, save the father. The father only knows the time. But we can see the signs. But it says one thing I'm going to leave with you guys. You can check the signs. And we see the signs. We know the signs. We know our salvation is closer than when we first believed. We know for a fact that it's going to happen one of these days. The trump of God will blast. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive. Alive, living sacrifice. Alive, living sacrifice. The Bible calls it, the same Paul that wrote, living sacrifice, said, those of us we, which are alive, we are not dead in sin, we are alive in righteousness in God. We are waiting on him like the five virgin scripture records, they had extra oil. Church, this is the time to have extra oil in your lantern. The world is getting darker. I read an article about one, I was going to show it to my wife, one of the greatest gospel singers that just came up from nowhere, said he doesn't believe in God anymore. He grew up in the church, his father was a pastor. And he just came from nowhere, he doesn't believe in God anymore. You see the falling away? And the Holy Spirit says, why are you surprised? They were not in before. Have you come to know Jesus? Have you given your life or you just come into church? Do you really know him? Are you really living for him? Do you know him? Okay. You say yes. Does he know you? That's the question I want you guys to ask, answer. Does he know me? Does God know you as his son? As his daughter? How come Abraham had the voice of God? Because Abraham was listening. Not everybody will hear when God speaks. Because so many of us don't listen, even though we are in the church. And that's why we've not had God. Does God know you? One of our assignments as pastors as God begins to put it in our heart, as there is this disturbance in our spirit about the coming of the Lord, one of the things we want to do is to help remind you guys and let prepare you guys for the coming of the Lord. And my prayer, and this is really true, my prayer, that none of us will miss it, But it takes a surrendered life. It takes a surrendered life. It's not what a man can promise you like we have promised people. It takes God knowing you. And it takes you willing to become a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable. <laughs> uh -huh, this is just my fear. I, I tremble over this. I tremble. As your pastor, I tremble over this. I'm only trembling for you guys. I tremble for my soul that I make it. And I make it. 
Not only tremble that I make it, I tremble my kids all make it. But myself, I'm a, we're talking about this sometime last week. I said, we can't get people to hell. And our own kids miss it. We can't go in the rapture and have them missing it. Their sins will pass away. They are passing away. The world is passing away. As we know the world, the coming of Christ is so near. It's like, I don't know how to explain this to you guys. It's so close. It's at the door. The signs all point to his coming. And it's stirring the heart of those that are listening. It's stirring their hearts. It says, get ready, get ready, get ready. I'm at the door. I'm coming soon. I'm coming soon. My reward is in my hand. Blessed are those that are alive. Blessed are those that wait for my coming. For they shall see my appearance. I hear that in my spirit every day. And I say, God, please don't make me, help me not to miss you. Because I don't want to miss you. I've served you this long. Everybody knows me to be your friend. Everybody knows me to, 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 to be your servant. God, I don't want to miss it. When people get there and they're saying, let's look for our pastor. And they look around. They can't even find me. God, I don't want to miss it. Because I know it's not what we think is the one that calls the shot. And for us to be at his will, we must give him all. And I beg you. I beg you all. Take a look at your Christian life. I pray the awakening spirit of God will awaken every one of us to be alive unto him. And so, Father, Lord, you see my heart. You know my trembling. You know my fear. in the name of Jesus. You help us to become living sacrifice. Lord, you help us to take a focus away from the things around us, but to less a focus on you. So that our life will be in conformity to your very will. And that you will be at the center of our life. Oh, we ask, I pray for your people that they will come back to you, those of them that are far away, they will come back. Draw us close to you. We love you, Lord. Father, I pray for those of us that have not known you. I'm asking those of you that have not made right with God, uh, you're not living the right, the life, or you are backsliding, or you're doing something that is, you're not really focused on the Lord. You are, your Christian life is wavering right now. It's not your fault. This is, this. but God wants to bring you back. And I want to pray for you that God will light fire in your faith. And the zeal of God will come back to you so that you don't miss it. If you are there, you have not given your life to Christ, you're watching me, or you've given your life, but you're bustling, you are not, you are lukewarm, I want to pray for you. I want to bow your heads and I'm going to pray for you. Lift up your hands if you're here. And place that hands in your, on your chest and ask that God will revive us. Lord, I pray for your sons and your daughter that, has, that is reconciling back to you. They're saying, Lord, they are renewing their covenant with you. They're promising to become living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. And they're submitting to your will, to your way. And to your plan and purpose for their life. They are saying no to sin and ungodliness. 
They are saying no, oh God, to everything that is the devil and they are cleaving to you to live a life that is glorious in your sight. Father, I ask Lord, you forgive. Turn their life around. Light your fire in their heart. That these ones will seek you. They will not be distracted. They will be, they will be focused on you waiting for your glorious appearing. Lord, I thank you for every one of us that when that time comes, we will be rapturable, we will be prepared for your coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you for watching. For more information, please contact the church at Fountain of Grace, 427 Turnpike Street, Canton, Mass, 02021. Or give us a call at 781-821-1121. You can email us at admin at fogbos.org or visit us online at fogbos.org.